get out your calculators, we're going to take a deep dive into the state's budget. One of the biggest items this year, repairing and upgrading Georgia's ailing infrastructure. But new bridges and roads don't come cheap. Can legislators make it happen without bringing up that dreaded T word, taxes? Also tonight, they drive your kids to school and serve up those cafeteria lunches. But Governor Deal says it's time to take away health care coverage for part-time school workers. Consider the gauntlet thrown. Lawmaker starts right now. Good evening and welcome to Lawmakers, day six of our coverage of the Georgia legislature. Tonight, billions of dollars are at stake with countless ideas on how they should be spent. So we're going to talk tonight about the budget. But first, let's check out what happened today under the Gold Dome. Pat St. Clair has tonight's Capitol Report. Thanks, Bill. We begin tonight with the growing debate over the issue of government and religion. On the House floor today, Representative Sam Teasley responded to a newspaper ad attacking his bill on religious liberty. This ad is disgusting. It is um, it is abhorrent. It is totally devoid of truth. It is absolutely unimaginable to me that someone could ever use in court as a successful defense that they could hide behind their religion to defend abuse of any kind. So again, this, the, the bill simply states government's got to demonstrate this compelling government interest, and I believe we could all agree that there is a compelling government interest in preventing child abuse. That religious liberty bill is something we expect to be hotly debated here at the Capitol this session. Tomorrow, a group of prominent Baptist clergy members will be here at the Capitol to express their concerns about the bill, and we will have more on that for you tomorrow in the show. But today, here at the Capitol, there was an unusual honor for the Atlanta Hawks. They're riding a 16-game winning streak. Lawmakers, for the very first time, recognized the team for their 46 years of service to the community. I went to see uh, Speaker Ralston and asked him, uh, could we bring the Hawks over? And at that time, we didn't know they would have won 16 straight games. <laughs> um, uh, the 20th uh, longest uh, winning streak in, in the NBA. Resolutions honoring the Hawks were read and passed in both the House and the Senate, honoring the team and its owners for being an Atlanta fixture since 1966. But Governor Nathan Deal is proud of that winning streak. It gives Georgians something else to be uh, celebrating in terms of our uh, professional sports teams in our state. And uh, they're at the top of the, of the heap right now, and we hope they continue there, and we're looking forward to a championship at the end of the year. The governor says with all the talk about the Braves and the Falcons' new stadiums, the Hawks should not be forgotten. I think it's good that we don't overlook the fact that uh, the Atlanta Hawks, who are in one of our well-established facilities there at Phyllis Arena, uh, that they're continuing to perform, and uh, we're hoping to have a an additional parking deck to accommodate the new fans that are going to be looking for a place to park their car. That's, that's one of the things that is in our budget uh, for this year. And on a lighter note, we want to share some stories about some very important and interesting people around the Capitol. Our person of interest this week is someone who has worked very hard to make things brighter when people come to visit. Meet Rob Conger, engineer for the Georgia Building Authority. He's been with the Building Authority for nine years. His innovative ideas have saved the state thousands of dollars. His top project this year? Upgrading all of the Capitol's lighting fixtures from standard light bulbs to energy efficient LEDs. Currently we replaced uh, 238 light fixtures and a total of uh, 342 light bulbs uh, within the Capitol. And all of those bulbs add up to more than $35,000 in savings for the state. The project itself costs $32,000. And officials tell us that a grant from Georgia Power means that the project will pay for itself in just seven months. Even better, the upgrade gives Georgians savings they can see. It's much more, uh, more bright. Uh, all of our displays along the walls and our pictures uh, are much more noticeable. Uh, the public seems to um, enjoy uh, viewing those and, and reading about our history here in the state. Well, it feels great. It feels great. 
it's glad to, I'm glad we're able to share what we have here in our capital with the residents of the state of Georgia. And of course, all of those brighter lights here at the Capitol means our pictures look that much better. Back to you, Bill. Thanks, Pat. Now, as you all know, the only mandated job of the Georgia General Assembly is to patch up, pass a budget every year. But anyone who's ever tackled any kind of budget, even a small household budget, knows that the devil is in the details. So what budget issues will be devil lawmakers this year? Our panel's ready to weigh in. Joining us tonight, Theron Johnson, a well-known Democratic political consultant and architect of many successful Georgia campaigns. Jackie Gingrich Cushman, syndicated conservative columnist and author. Jim Galloway, the longtime political reporter um, and observer for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. His political insider blog is must-read every day on the AJC website. And Eric Tannenblatt, one of Georgia's most highly respected advisors to GOP candidates from local to national level. We'll be talking with um, all of our guests later on tonight about some doings with presidential candidates out in Iowa, and that's going to be fun. But first, let's start by talking about the um, budget. Jim Galloway, let me start with you. It, it is, seems fairly clear already that the issue that we're going to be talking about night after night, as you're going to be reporting day after day, is going to be about transportation and how the state's going to pay for what it needs, right? Yes, exactly. But not a word was that it was in of that was in the budget uh, proposed by Governor Nathan Deal. Nothing week. about how they're going to pay Nothing for it. Nothing about how they're going to pay for it or how much they're going to spend. Yeah. Uh, just uh, just an outline, $21.7 billion, $900 million more than the previous year. That's that's good. We like that. We So there'll be less fighting uh, uh, the, uh, over, over the scraps here. Uh, we have a school system raises oh by 280 million to and school systems will be allowed to ch choose whether they raise raise uh, uh, salaries for teachers uh, full, fill out the 180 school days or reduce classroom sizes their choice uh, but we, they're saying the layoffs are over and the we, furlough we are days past, are over we are past the layoffs right. and, we, and we are past the furloughs uh, 70 million dollar increase in Medicaid we can fight over expansion through that right now. Uh, we also have a $23 million addition for a parking co uh, complex right next to the Falcon Station. Uh, the, uh, the new stadium. stadium. The new yeah. stadium. So bringing that total up to $40 million. So we got lots to argue about and talk about. Okay. So let's start, if we can, with transportation. But, but, but Theron Johnson, let me, if you don't mind, frame it this sure. way. You know, in some ways, having money for the first time in a number of years uh, it's a good thing in most ways, mm -hmm. but it also puts a certain amount of pressure on Republicans, doesn't it? Because suddenly there is pie to be divided up and they're going to have to figure out where it goes. They can't use austerity as an excuse this year. Absolutely. I mean, for the first time in a long time, the party of no uh, in Georgia and nationally actually are going to be direct beneficiaries of this Obama economy that's been recovering. I mean, <laughs> the, tr <laughs> the, the truth is that when you hear 21.7 billion uh, in, in a budget. I mean, that's remarkable. But let's just focus on transportation. Any poll that you do, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, whether it's statewide or local, transportation is always going to be one of the top three issues that people say that they want to be changed. I mean, every single day, people are in traffic. Uh, people are tired of the long commute. And so for Republicans to not join Democrats and saying, hey, we are willing to work with you to do something about our transportation problem in the state, I think they're missing an opportunity. Now, now they'll talk about it and they're afraid to use the word transit, but at the end of the day, they've got to do something about transportation because the people in Georgia want it. All right, but they've got bigger issues here. Oh, well, let's, let's, let's stay with that issue for a minute because there have been leading Republicans that have said, including Governor Deal, and he didn't include it in his budget, but he's clearly said we have to address transportation. Numerous Republicans, well, tra but all the above, transportation. Right. You've seen Casey Cagle say that. You've seen a variety of people talk about we need to address transportation. I think it's actually very smart of Governor Deal not to propose a solution until they've actually looked at what's out there and what can be done. And they've done that. They've submitted a report, which I'm sure y'all have all, you know, dwelt over for a long time about the possibilities of what can happen. <laughs> and I think what we've seen on the transportation side is a combination. And if you look at the polls, the one where they're split a third, a third, a third, support opposed undecided is when you have some kind of combination. And, and, and let's look at that because, Eric, at, at, 
we have a WSB TV landmark poll, which sort of lays out the, the dilemma that Republicans, particularly as leaders of the General Assembly, face, but Democrats do too. So here's what the uh, landmark uh, WSB poll showed. 61% oppose a hike in the gas tax to pay the billion plus dollars that we're, uh, we apparently need to get our roads up to, to snuff. 23% say they'd support it, 16% are undecided. Now look at the next set of figures on this one, uh, if we have those. 36% say they'd support the tax hike, of, a gas tax hike, if there was an accompanying income tax uh, reduction. 32% still oppose the gas tax hike. Okay. These numbers show what a dilemma this is for everyone in the legislature. Sure. Well, anytime you talk about raising taxes, you're going to get an, a response of people opposing it. And I think it's up to the legislature and, and the leaders in the state to make the case to, to the citizens of the state why we need to do this. Okay. So you're saying it's a matter of framing. I, I, I think I'm hearing you say, but I don't want to put words in your mouth, is a tax, is a revenue increase of some sort inevitable to pay for all of this? And well, is it then a matter of framing it properly so well, voters will accept it? We're going to have to come up with more revenue, but it is the way you frame it. And there is some discussion about mm -hmm. offsetting it, whether it's with an income tax reduction or some other means. And so it's really going to, the legislators are going to have to come up with a way. Ven to, venue to fund is it. very important here, too. And, and, and Eric, you tell me if I'm, if, if, if I'm missing the boat on this. But what you're going to have to do is you, initially you're going to have to have a bill that starts in the House, gets through a Republican controlled House. House with Republican caucus approval, goes to the Senate, gets out of the Senate uh, with, with Senate Republican caucus approval, then goes to House committee, and that's where all bets are off. That's where, that's where Democrats, because. that's where, because the, the bill can be completely wholly remade, Democrats are in play at that point, that's when you'll have your bargaining over, over what we say or how much we spend on transit, and that's when we'll really get down to the nitty gritty of, of how much money is moved to transportation funding and where it comes from. All right, you all may be brighter than I about uh, the notion of an offset here. But when you say, well, we could look at reducing income tax in favor of an increase in gas tax, are you robbing Peter to pay Paul? Is that, are you really coming up with the kind of revenues you need if you take that kind of approach? Well, one of the things I think that's really sort of telling about the governor and really, you know, people reelected him to lead. And I, I'm not buying this whole, he strategically left it out because he wants people to come together with a solution. At the end of the day, people were reelected to go to the Gold Dome to lead. And I think that if you're really looking for revenue, I mean, one of the places that they can start is basically, again, revisiting sort of their distance uh, around ACA and really looking at Medicaid expansion and taking that money. I mean, that's money that we can take towards transportation. But, but, but it's, all, it's all a matter of, of priorities. I mean, I remember when I worked for Governor Purdue the year he uh, took office, we had a $1.65 billion uh, deficit, and we had to come up with ways in which to fill that. And there was an increase in the cigarette tax, but it was offset with a tax cut for mm -hmm. seniors in the out years. So it's not just a matter of just, you know, increasing revenue. I mean, they, they, we have to put some constraints. But, but that, that, if I'm not mistaken, that tax was passed pretty much on with, with some Republican participation, but with mostly Democratic votes, was it not? It, well, but it also, we also had uh, with that were um, spending cuts too of about a billion dollars. All right. And see, see, if you also look at who currently is, is seated in the House and the Senate in Georgia, we're dominated by Republicans. So, you know, the, the, the reality is to get the first round done, it can be done with Republicans. But in the end, there's going to be have to see some outreach All right, Democrats. We, we've got to move on. But who's going to step up and take a leadership role in saying, yep, we need a tax I, I think that's what we're going to wait and see. And I think Eric has a really good point. It's not just about seeing where the polls are today. But a real leader, as we know, is not the person who looks at what's currently happening and say, gosh, isn't that interesting. It's a person who can look down in the future and say, this is where we as a community need to go and can help us get there. All right, let me keep this with you, Jackie, uh, if I may. Another issue that uh, has emerged in this budget is the governor's proposal to uh, uh, take away from uh, uh, part-time school workers, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, the health care <coughs> benefits they've enjoyed 
uh, up until now. This is causing a huge storm of controversy in the legislature, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, well among, it's pretty I'm sorry, about, among the school groups. Right, rather. well, absolutely. Um, and, and again, I'll give a shout out to Mrs. Dabney, who was a school bus driver for my children. <laughs> She's absolutely wonderful. And the challenge we have is the governor has clearly said his point is that it's not fair because there are other part-time workers uh, in Georgia for the state that do not receive these benefits. But these people have been receiving them and are used to them. So the challenge and what we do from a corporate perspective, because I spent decades in corporate budgeting, was you'd look at their total compensation package and figure out a way how to keep them, right, receiving the same type of compensation. So there's got to be some kind of transitional period or some kind of way to make them whole for some time period because you can't all of a sudden say, you know, good luck, we've been working and this is what you've been getting. But it doesn't and I, work I actually now. think uh, some of those workers can go on the federal health exchange and get health coverage. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim, let me ask you, one of the things that was sort of interesting to me about this was that it was a complete surprise to everyone. Exactly. They, were, they yes. in no way paved the way for this. I'm not sure how you could cushion the blow to people who may lose their health insurance. Nevertheless, it was a stunning kind of announcement. Right. For it, was, it was it was it was it uh, was House members and Senate, senators have told me that they were surprised mm -hmm. that it, what, this was a shock. But I would, I would, uh, I had a, an interesting conversation with uh, uh, Jack Hill, the chairman of the Senate Appropriations uh, Committee, before I came over here, and uh, his dad was president of the School Bus Association, ah. School Bus Drivers <laughs> Association, back in the days, in the eighties, in the in the seventies and eighties, when they got this benefit. Now. The president of the School Bus Drivers Association son now controls a good portion <laughs> of the budget. Yeah. I think we're going to see something worked out. I don't. That, that's that's one point. So I th I, the other point is that these it, it's not just the school bus drivers. It's it's the the place they hold in the community, and these people are you know. You don't get to be a school bus driver in a small county in Georgia without knowing somebody. They've got, and they take responsibility for these children they, they from the time kids. they leave They're their house. The, is this smart politics for the government? Look, he'll never run for election again. Yeah. Nevertheless, is this a smart pl place this, for Republicans to this be? Is very, this is very sad. I mean, the, the point uh, the point of the matter is, is that we're spending time talking about this. They can find the money to basically make sure that they keep these health benefits for these part-time uh, school bus drivers and these cafeteria workers. I mean, this is very sad. These are people who have had these jobs for decades. And as Jim pointed out, I mean, this is not new. I mean, for the governor to kind of lay this on the basically on the desk of these legislators, I think was very disingenuous. But at the end of the day, they need to find the money. And we don't need to be cutting uh, health benefits from part-time. And let's remember, this is just the start of the process. Mm -hmm. The governor right. presents the budget, and now the legislature rolls up their sleeves, and then they have Yeah, to but it's through. also responsible for people like me to basically speak up and say that this is just crazy. Do you want a um, cynical voice on this? Sure. <laughs> the governor, <laughs> governor, <laughs> governor couldn't find the last $135 million that he wanted to, 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 to put into the budget, so he gave it to the legislature knowing that they would try people, to cover them on it. Out, Say, right. you guys find the $135 million and we'll call it I, I do feel as we go to break mm -hmm. in a second here, I do get the sense in hearing from all of you that you all expect there's going to be a development in this that will probably rescue this insurance. Am I, you if you're a school bus driver, don't panic yet. Okay, fine. <laughs> fine. Well, we'll watch this, obviously, and uh, continue to report on it. Still ahead tonight on Lawmakers, um, we're going to talk about the issue of driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants. Joe, that just took an interesting turn in a federal court in Arizona. Question is, how might it affect a proposed bill here? We'll be back with that and more in just a moment. In a break, a state representative confesses to a serious addiction. Really, take a look. Representative John Pezold is a Republican from Fortson. He represents House District 133. He was sworn into the General Assembly in 2013. This second term lawmaker tells us the people at his local movie theater know him by name. Not because he's there to see the movies. He says it's because he has a serious addiction to movie theater popcorn. And has even figured out that it'll stay fresh in the fridge for up to a week. A fresh round of discussions when Lawmakers continues. In its earliest days, the Georgia legislature met first in Savannah, then in Augusta, Louisville, Georgia, and Milledgeville. In 1868, the Capitol and the General Assembly settled permanently in Atlanta. 
Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. Tonight, our panel includes Theron Johnson, a Democratic political strategist, Jackie Gingrich Cushman, a conservative commentator and blogger, Jim Galloway, the political reporter at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and Eric Tannenblatt, Republican political strategist. All right, let's talk. Federal judge in Arizona has just said that an Arizona statute that would forbid the issuing of driver's licenses to um, undocumented, what's the specifics of that? It's a certain category of undocumented. It's the, dr the, the, dream, the, 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 dream, the, the dream kids and the dream adults who were covered by uh, right. President mm -hmm. Obama's so, decision. So the question becomes, Jim, um, we have a bill right now that it's been filed by Senator Josh McCoon, which would deny driver's licenses to the undocumented residents who are now being protected by the president's right. executive order. It, is there any reason to think that they're going to have to freeze on this one, um, or will they well, go it's, full it's just, speed let's, ahead? It, let's say it's just a, 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 a reason to pause and think just a little bit, because it, uh, the, 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 the Arizona decision would rise up through a different appellate course sure. than any, any, any law in, in Georgia. But it raises the point, and I will tell you, I think that this has been tried in, in several other various forms over the last three or four uh, uh, sessions of the General Assembly, and it's been blocked every time. Every time it seems to go down in defeat. So it's going to be interesting to watch how that un unfolds. Um, if, you, if you get into, I, I will tell you what, if you get into a situation where Republicans in the legislature feel that they need to be on record as punishing Obama for, for, for taking the initiative on this, then maybe the bill goes forward. Okay, let's do a little scattershot approach to things right now. Theron Johnson, you mentioned something in the first block I want to go back and pick up on. Mm -hmm. The governor has put 70 plus million dollars into his budget for Medicaid. Uh, by the way, that doesn't seem like an enormous amount of money for a system like Medicaid. That's an increase. That's an increase. Well, an increase. Right. Nevertheless, it seems it once again raises the question, and you actually brought it up, of whether or not the governor ought to be thinking seriously about talking to the legislature about taking the federal Medicaid money at this point. Absolutely. I mean, he, he's the governor for the second term. He's won his reelection. I mean, I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think last year alone we lost almost $300,000. 300 million. Yeah, th I'm sorry, 300 million uh, in, in funds that actually could have gone to people who deserve Medicaid in the state right now. So now is the time, and this is one of those bipartisan moments where I think the, the governor can really reach out to some Democrats and not be ashamed of working with the federal. Now, if you really look at the governor, governor's tone. I mean, he's changed his tone yeah. towards the president a little bit when it comes to education. Well, here's another opportunity for him to sort of change his tone. Could you imagine this happening, either of you, on the Republican I, yeah, side I, of the I, table? I don't think it's going to happen. I think part <laughs> of the challenge is, as we all know, gifts from the federal government are not free and they don't last forever. So the challenge you have as a governor is figuring out how do you, if you accept this, what are the Right? How are you hand handcuffed? And what do you do in the future? So you can't lock yourself into a program where you don't know what happens in the future and you're stuck with a bill down the road. Plus, we have a Republican-controlled Congress now. And we have to mm -hmm. give the new Congress an opportunity to see what their proposals are. As okay, so we're probably not going to see it but, moving but, forward. But every answer on the show has been, let's wait and see. Wait and see. Let's wait and see what the Republican Congress is going to do. Let's wait and see what the governor's, uh, people are going to react to the governor's budget. When are Republicans in this state going to lead? Oh, That's wait, wait, wait. wait. Th Theron, it's, it's January. I mean, people have just gotten... Wait we, we and are, see. No, 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 no. You, look, you go look back and we we'll see the Republicans have said about transportation and the need for funding and the need to get things done. I think you'll see a lot of leadership. Okay, I think you're the, being very, right. you're, you're, the, pick, the, you're the, picking, the, you're the, picking the and choosing. The best way to judge a leader, and whether he's a Republican <laughs> or Democrat, is where right. he puts his money where his mouth is. All right, his money right now is not on transfer. We are going to have so much time in the weeks ahead to debate this. Let me move on to a final subject with a couple minutes we have remaining. Your father, Newt Gingrich, was mm -hmm. in Iowa with a number of Lovely state. potential <laughs> Republican <laughs> candidates for president. Uh, let me, what did you think about that lineup? Uh, Rick Santorum, Rick Perry, Sarah Palin. It's going to take you half an hour to name them all. Come exactly on. That's exactly right. Chris Christie. <laughs> ben Carson. Ben, Scott ben, Walker. Ben you Carson. Walker there. Walker. We've got, yeah. So Donald is this Trump. the field? Is this the field you, is, Your this the, is, is this the field you're hoping to see uh, run for president? Well, it doesn't matter what I hope or not hope. It's, it's who decides they actually want to run. Um, and as many PACs that have already been formed, until people actually say they're going to run for president, they're not actually running. So has your dad called you and said, you know, I was there because I might put my toe in the water again? He hasn't said that yet. But what I, what I can tell you is that <laughs> unless you've, um, having gone through a Republican primary, um, unless you've gone through a national campaign, 
you have no idea how hard it is. And I'm saying that because I think a lot of times people start down that road and they don't understand it's not like running for a governor and it's not like running for a congressman. It is a totally different game. Neither of the men who you have liked so much for president, um, uh, or, or let me say uh, Mitt Romney wasn't in Iowa this weekend, and Jeb Bush, who I think you have some relationship, wasn't there either. Do you, are these the right guys to be the Republican for forerunners on a presidential bid? The well, ones this, out was there? Just, this was just one of Mm -hmm. There were other candidates, too, like uh, Marco Rubio wasn't there. Rand Paul wasn't there. I think that, you know, I've heard as, as many as 25 potential candidates that may run in this presidential mm -hmm. race. So these, it's still these very were the early. People, these were the people who think that they might have a shot in yeah. Iowa. And I think you're going to see, you're, you're seeing some movement in the Republican Party uh, by candidates who may be thinking about skipping that. All right, we are well, out of, go ahead, real quick. I just think that the Republicans have a messaging and, re and platform problem. And it was so convenient that Mitt Romney Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, and Rand Paul all had scheduling conflicts. What are, what are the, what's in a couple of words would you say was the tone of the event in Iowa? Deja vu. Deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Jackie Cushman, Eric Tannen, Blad Theron Johnson, Jim Galloway, thank you so much for being here tonight. We'll see you again as we continue with our coverage of the legislature and politics in Georgia. So day six of the 2015 session is now a wrap. We'll be back tomorrow night for coverage of Day 7. In the meantime, stay in touch with us on social media or email us at lawmakers at gpb.org. Thanks so much for being with us. I'm Bill Nygut. Have a great evening. This is a GPB original production.